What I wanted to do, first of all, really, was to tell you a bit about my life, because I think all too often when people are looking for a good idea, the best place to find a good idea is what lays within. Now, I was actually born in Jamaica. I was born in a place called Clarendon, so there's probably a number of people from Clarendon. How are you? <laughs> So as, as we know, Clarendon is right in the heart of the island and, and they call it, call it to the bush. And um, I came to this country when I was um, four years old and I was brought up in a place called Small Heath in Birmingham. And you could probably see that small house there. There were 11 of us living in a two up, two down. Now, that's, I've got nine brothers and sisters with my parents. And I went back there last Friday and it was quite an experience. The first time I went back in about 30 years. And what was quite ironic about living in a house like that is that the front room, there was 11 of us living in a terrace house, but that front room nobody could live in. <laughs> they had all those, you know, those starch things and the ducks against the wall and all that sort of stuff. So it brought back some serious memories. So there was nine of us living in that, but my father had an allotment, and it was my responsibility as the eldest boy to look after his allotment. Now, what he used to do is that, as punishment, he used to send me to go and pick the Brussels sprouts in, in the middle of the winter. So if you want to punish any of your children, send them to go and pick Brussels sprouts in the middle of the winter. But I actually loved being in that environment, because small heat, it, well, when I went back, it was still the same. Very, very much a sort of concrete jungle. And that, you know, to be in this sort of open space where there's this real sense of country, at the age of 12 years old, I can remember making a promise to myself that one day I would own my own part of Britain. And it took me 40 years to achieve that dream. So it's very, very important that the power of dreams. So I was one of the... Now, um, I was one of those boys who went to the local secondary modern school and left at 16, and I was a real pain in the ass. My headmaster thought that I would end up in prison, left school without any qualification. I was really, really difficult. And then um, I went from there into the army, not because I wanted to be a soldier of any sort, it's just that there was nothing else for me to do. And in those days, the one thing you couldn't be is a black pen in the ass, because, you know, they kicked the shit out of me as they did. <laughs> so I lasted about a year, and um, so I, I was kicked out of the army. And, <laughs> and uh, in, in those days, the only thing available to people who were on society's dustbin who were failure was catering. And luckily, I went into catering, and I actually liked it, and I, and I worked as a chef for, um, for a while. And then the thing about being an immigrant is that we're always driven. Our parents came to this country with a massive sacrifice. And something else I want everybody to try and remember here is that, you know, we are offspring of great entrepreneurs. It took massive courage. <laughs> It took massive courage on the behalf of our parents to give up all the stuff that they did to come here so they could give us um, um, a better quality of life. So it is part of our DNA. It is within us to be entrepreneurs. So it's quite important to sort of remember that. Anyhow, because I know I haven't got much time, is that I, I, I decided that actually I wanted to better myself life, and I decided that I wanted to get into television. Now, all of my friends and my family looked at me and said, well, you could hardly read and write. How in God's name do you think you're going to get a job in television? Because in those days, it was full of a lot of this sort of Oxbridge type, and it probably still is today. And, um, but I was determined, and it took me a whole year of pestering. If you, anybody in this room said they worked in television, I'd be latching onto them like no one's business. I was determined to get in television. And I did. It took me a year to do it. And I worked as a producer, director, in a program called the Food and Drink Program. And that program allowed me to go and travel around the world to, to make films uh, about food and drink. But even that wasn't enough. I did that for about 15 years. And TV is pretty glamorous, but it's very, very much a young person's business. So I decided to set up my own food and drink marketing agency. The thing about somebody like me and a lot of entrepreneurs is that, you know, you can't work for anybody else. It's just you're difficult. You're a real pain. <laughs> I think some of the organizer, organizer here might actually um, concur with that. <laughs> you always want to do things your own way. So I set up my own marketing agency that specialized in, in, in food and drink brands. And I wanted to work with brands that were a bit like me, really. They were entrepreneurial. They wanted to change things. They didn't want to accept the, the status quo. So I worked on brands like Lloyd Gross and Sources, Kettle Chips, Cobra Beer, etc., etc. That gave me the money to then buy my farm. So I went to, so that dream was still pushed me forward, and so it gave me money to go and buy my farm. Now, one of the things about having clients is that they're real difficult pain in the asses, and they never do as you actually want them to do. 
So I always wanted to actually come up with a brand where I could actually do the sort of stuff that I think you, you need to do in terms of getting your brand heard. So when I, and this is how life comes together, you know, and it might sound pretty spiritual, but I do think it has a lot to play with it, is that um, when I moved down to, to De when, when I bought the farm in Devon, um, the, none of these people had ever seen a black person before. Not only had they seen, never seen a black person before, they said, a black person has been a farmer, are you mad? So, um, and so they referred to me as the black farmer. And being a marketing man, I thought, actually, that is a really good idea. <laughs> so I love those people down in the West Country. They gave, me, <laughs> they gave me a really good sort of business idea. And so what I wanted to do is that I wanted to create a brand that was mainstream. One of the biggest problems we have as black people in this country is the moment you come up with a brand, you know, I, I, I'll tell you a story actually, is that when I came up with this brand idea and I got my sausages developed and I, I decided to go in and sell these sausages into the supermarkets, the buyer said to me, um, sausages, black farmer sausages, now are these sausages for black people? And, <laughs> and I said, no, 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 these are sausages for the mainstream. I, you know, I, don't want, I don't want to have a product that is just there for, um, for black people where you tend to get ghettoized. This is a mainstream product. It just happens that I'm a black guy who is part of the mainstream. Now, when you're trying to, 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 to launch a product, you're trying to get into the mainstream, there's masses of risk, there's masses of it. And when you're starting off your brand, you bleed money, you hemorrhage money like no one's business. But for people to take you serious, especially as a black person, you have to go beyond the call of duty. You've really got to come up with great ideas. You've really got to demonstrate to them that you really know what you're talking about.